In this video, we will continue talking about Kruskal's algorithm. We will go into more details about how to implement the algorithm and analyze its running time. Hopefully, we now have a good understanding of how and why Kruskal's algorithm works. Let's talk more about how to implement it. In every round of Kruskal's algorithm, we do the same thing. So the main work is to see how to implement a single round. On this slide, we again have the high-level description of what we do in the ith round. In the ith round, we consider the ith lightest edge. If this edge has both endpoints in the same set of our partition, then we do nothing. Otherwise, if the edge has its endpoints in distinct sets of the partition, then we add the edge to our set of edges A, and we merge the sets of the partition containing its endpoints. Okay, so let's try to break down what we need to do to implement this into simpler tasks. The first thing that we have to do is we have to find the ith lightest edge. We're going to be processing the ith lightest edge, so we need to know what it is. The next thing that we have to do is determine if the endpoints of this edge are in the same set of the partition. We have to do this because this will determine what action we take on the edge. Finally, we want to be able to merge two sets in the partition. We will need to do this if the endpoints of the edge are in different sets of the partition. Okay, so now we've broken down the work that we have to do and around into these three simpler tasks. So let's consider the first task we have to identify the ith lightest edge. How can we do that? Well, we can just sort the edges by weight from smallest to largest, and then we can iterate over the edges in order of weight. So in the ith round, we know exactly what the ith lightest edge is. So we can sort the edges in time proportional to the number of edges times the logarithm of the number of edges. And this actually turns out to be the most time-intensive step of Kruskal's algorithm. So this takes care of the first task. Now we're left with tasks two and three, which we're going to consider together. These tasks don't actually, in and of themselves, have much to do with graphs. So we're actually going to abstract out these tasks. So what we have is some sets of numbers. In our application, the numbers are the labels of the vertices. So they are just the numbers 0 through n minus 1. So we have some sets that partition the numbers 0 through n minus 1. Here's an example where we have four sets partitioning the numbers 0 through 10. Now, what operations do we want to support on these sets in order to do tasks 2 and 3? Well, given two numbers, we want to be able to tell if they are in the same set of the partition. And we want to be able to merge the sets of the partition containing two given numbers. In our application, these two numbers will be the endpoints of an edge. So concretely, we want to be able to answer questions like, are three and five in the same set of the partition? And you know, in this case, the answer would be no, they're not. And then the other operation that we want to support is to merge the sets containing 3 and 5. So if we were to do that, then we would have the following picture. So I've merged the sets containing the element 3 and the element 5. And now on the right, the green set has the elements 0, 3, 4, and 5. So what we need is a data structure. We want a way to store the sets of the partition in order to do these two operations of determining if two numbers are in the same set and merging the sets containing two numbers. And we want to be able to do this efficiently. So the data structure that we need is called the union find data structure, It's sometimes also called the disjoint set data structure. It supports the operations of find and union 
which is exactly what we need for tasks two and three in Kruskal's algorithm. So let's go into these operations of find and union. The find operation on input P returns the identifier of the set containing P. So if we want to tell if P and Q lie in the same set, we call find on P and we call find on Q. These will return the same result if and only if P and Q lie in the same set. The other operation supported is union. So union takes two arguments, P and Q, and when we call union on inputs P and Q, it will merge the set containing P with the set containing Q. So unfortunately, in this class, we don't have time to go over exactly how the union find data structure works. But let me give you a very high level idea of how to implement a union find data structure here. So the key idea is to represent each set as a tree, where the elements in the tree are the elements of the set. These do not have to be binary trees. A node can have more than two children. So in the picture here, I've drawn them as binary trees, but that doesn't have to be true in general. In fact, there's no penalty for a node to have a lot of children. And we want the height of these trees to be as small as possible. So in this representation, where a set is represented by a tree, the identifier of a set is just the root element of the tree. So the identifier of the blue set, the far left set, would be 7, and the identifier of the green set would be 5. In our data structure, each element is going to store the name of its parent in the tree. So to do a find operation on an element P, we use these parent pointers to trace up the tree from P to the root, and then we return the value of the root. So for example, to do a find operation on 10, then we look up 10 and see that its parent is 2. Then we look at the parent of 2 and we see that's 9. And then we see that 9 is a root. So then we return 9. So the find operation on 10 would return 9. So that's the find operation. The complexity is proportional to the height of the tree. So like we've seen in heaps and binary search trees, here as well, we want to keep the height of these trees as small as possible. Now let us look at the union operation. Say that we want to do a union of 4 and 2. So the first thing that we do is we do a find on 4 and a find on 2. So this tells us the root elements of their respective trees. In this case, the root of the tree containing 4 is 5, and the root of the tree containing 2 is 9. We then set the parent of the root of the smaller tree to be the root of the larger tree. Okay, so you see that in this example here, I've set the parent of 5 to be 9. So remember that these don't have to be binary trees, so this operation is fine to do. The reason why we do union with this rule, that the root of the larger tree becomes the parent of the root of the smaller tree, is that this actually guarantees that the height of the trees remains order log n. And remember, it's good for us to have the height of the trees be small, because that determines the complexity of our operations. <clears throat> so the complexity of the union operation, in particular, is also proportional to the height of the tree. What do we have to do in a union operation? Well, we have to do two find operations to find the root elements of the respective sets that we're merging. And then after that, we just have constant more work to update the parent pointer of the root of the smaller tree. So under this scheme, where the heights of the trees is order log n, the complexity of both union and find becomes order log n. So now we've given a high level description of a simple union find data structure that can do both the union and the find operations in time order log n. Let's apply this back to Kruskal's algorithm. The number of rounds in Kruskal's algorithm is at most the number of edges. 
And when we process an edge, we might have to do a couple find operations and potentially a union operation. So to do this part of a round will take time order log n overall. So this gives time order number of edges times log n to process all the edges. That is to do tasks two and three on, on each edge. Remember that we also spent time order the number of edges times log n to sort the edges by weight so that we could iterate over the edges in order from smallest to largest. So the overall, the running time of Kruskal's algorithm becomes order number of edges times log n. So we obtain a time bound that actually matches what we got for Prim's algorithm. There's actually a more advanced version of the union, union fine data structure that can achieve better time complexity. It can do any sequence of m union and find operations and time order m times alpha of n. So here alpha of n is a function which is called the inverse Ackermann function. It's a non-constant function, but it grows extremely slowly with n. So for example, alpha of 2 to the power 2 to the power 2 to the power 2 to the power 16 is at most 5. So for any number you could ever practically encounter, alpha will be at most 5. In the simple version of union find, we guaranteed that every operation took time order log in. So here the bound is slightly different. It is an amortized time bound. So we cannot guarantee that every union or find operation will take time alpha of n. Some of these might take more time. But over a sequence of m operations, the average time per union or find is alpha of n. Or in other words, the total time we spend to do a sequence of m union and find operations is time order m times alpha of n. So this amortized time bound, it's like the same thing we saw when pushing back to a vector. Pushing back to a vector is not always a constant time operation because sometimes we run out of capacity in the vector and we have to allocate more memory. But the total time to do m pushback operations is always order m. So we say pushback has constant amortized time complexity. So this more advanced union fine data structure shows that the bottleneck in Kruskal's algorithm is actually in sorting the edges. The total time spent doing tasks two and three can be bounded by order the number of edges times alpha of n. There's actually another algorithm that can achieve running time order the number of edges times alpha of n overall to compute a minimum spanning tree. So this uses a, a different approach, which is given in a paper by Chazelle called a minimum spanning tree algorithm with inverse Ackermann type complexity. So it still actually remains an open problem if computing a minimum spanning tree can be done in linear time, that is in time just proportional to the number of edges.